go ahead. It's just been a great um, couple months here getting to know uh, Adam and Ro. It's been phenomenal uh, to hear their story and uh, find out how much we actually have in common um, is, is pretty uh, amazing. And uh, just really glad to be here. Beautiful. So, I, bro, I see you're <laughs> you're ready to jump right in. Go. I am because you said we have a lot in common, and we do. So I want to unpack it. I want to go all the way back. Adam likes to relate the gritability stuff back to sports very often, and I know you're an athlete, and you have this amazing story about you know being an athlete, and then something happened, and then so let's just start there before I try not to give it away, but give it away. All right. Um, I am from originally from South Carolina, um, grew up with uh, not a whole lot uh, to work with, um, very humble beginnings and two older brothers um, and just uh, was trying to find a way to uh, live the life of my dreams, which was uh, wanting to take care of my future family, my future wife, my future kids. And the way I thought I was going to be able to do that was through the National Football League. Um, I was an outstanding athlete. Uh, naturally strong, played um, um, football, college ball for Wingate University, uh, which was my uh, unfortunate mistake. But uh, what, do you, what do you mean by unfortunate well, mistake? Tell us I was about I was recruited by the University of South Carolina uh, when uh, Coach Lou Holtz and uh, Charlie Strong was the defensive coordinator. Um, and I had an opportunity to go there, but I was going to be guaranteed to be redshirted. And unfortunately, um, Wingate also offered, made me an offer and told me that I would not have to sit the bench and be redshirted. And I wanted to play right away uh, because the, the, the goal was always to uh, leave school after my junior year and declare for the NFL draft and um, didn't see it clearly. And I went on to Wingate University instead. Um, and the reason why I say it was a mistake is because at that time, uh, even more so than it is today, is that Division II players didn't get recruited um, or, or, you know, not recruited, but uh, looked at for the NFL draft at that time. And so uh, regardless of the fact of how well I would play, um, I would not probably get drafted coming out of Wingate University more than likely. So um, I played defensive end. I went there. I had a, a phenomenal season. Uh, then met my future wife at that time, um, ended up getting married while I was still in college, um, had a phenomenal year, um, and decided I would transfer. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, transfers weren't like they were today, where you could just jump in the transfer portal. Uh, they can't stop you. They can't encumber you. They can't do anything. Uh, didn't work out that way. So I decided I would transfer, uh, and my coach at the time blocked the transfer. Ooh. And so when he did that, uh, that would mean I would have to sit out for two full seasons. Two, two, two seasons? Two full seasons. What? I I've was never gonna, heard of that. Yeah, I was going to transfer to University of South Carolina. Um, and, yeah, that's what happened. So I had two choices. I could go ahead and transfer because at that point, with him blocking my transfer, there was no chance I was going to play, uh, play for him. So I went ahead and uh, declared for the NFL draft. Uh, hired an agent, declared for the draft. I uh, was an unbelievable athlete. It was 275 pounds. Uh, a lot of you listening to this podcast will appreciate this. 275 pounds. I could run a 4.3940 uh, with a stopwatch, 4.4 um, electronic timer. Um, I was jumping about 43 inches, um, doing 225 about 29 times on a good day. Um, I was unbelievable. Um, short shuttle was 4.4. Um, so I had a uh, great lateral quickness um, and was going to go to the, the NFL. I was sure of it. I got the invite to the NFL combine. Um, I was preparing for that combine, and I was in the greatest shape of my life. And how much could you squat? Because you uh, just told us. It, it so. was uh, – many people don't believe this, but it's actually true. Uh, a little over 1,100 pounds. Amazing. Um, and I, I'm told that's some kind of record, but – um, at the time, it seemed kind of normal to me, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's what I was doing in college. In high school, I was, I was squatting over 900 pounds in high school. Wow. Um, so I had great explosiveness. Um, and I was on track. I was ready. Uh, we had done everything right. Um, I was on my last tune-up session, and I'll never forget it. I was in a tune-up session uh, running 40s. Um, and it was my last 
workout before the combine. Um, and my lovely wife, Nicole, said, um, Aaron, I think you've run enough. You know, I'd run like nine or I believe it was nine, uh, nine forties. Um, and for whatever reason that day, I couldn't quite get the four three. Um, and me being competitive, I was like, man, I kept running like four, 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 one, four, four, two, four, four, one point five. I mean, it was like really close and I just really want that four, three. Um, I got to four, three on the last one, but I also got my hamstring. Um, I pulled my left hamstring grade two. Um, so it wasn't very good. I couldn't, uh, do anything. Uh, went on to the combine anyway, but could not work out. All I could do was talk to teams. Um, and, and really at the time did not realize that that would be uh, what would end up ending my dream to go to the National Football League because after that combine, I um, rehabbed, I healed, um, got back on my feet uh, better than I was even before um, and could not get another invite to the combine and could not get a tryout. Um, I did uh, was able to try out for the Philadelphia Soul um, in the Arena League um, they made an offer to me. Uh, the contract was like under, you know, 30 grand a year. Um, didn't really make a whole lot of sense, yeah. you know. Um, then I had an opportunity to play in the CFL. Uh, they made an offer about $60,000. Um, but that was after, kind of after I had gotten a, gotten a job. Um, but um, that's when things got really tough. Um, we were living on student loans at the time, Nicole and I. And uh, don't ever do that. It's a really bad idea. Um, and so we were living on those student loans, and the money ran out. And so um, I would not give up on my dream. Um, I kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. Um, and eventually we would actually end up uh, losing everything. Um, we would end up uh, in our car. Mm. Um, and that was tough. Uh, that was a tough, tough moment because – um, I felt like at that time I had failed. Um, I failed as a husband, failed as, um, you know, being a successful human being in life. Um, and here it was, you know, sleeping in a car and my wife sleeping in a car with me. And it was uh, really, really hard. Um, and I refused to go back home. Uh, I refused to uh, ask, ask my parents to bail me out because um, I just didn't think that you know, I, they didn't get me in the mess, so I figured I'd get myself out. And so I uh, continued to battle. At that point, I had an option. I could go to work at a Wendy's uh, that was across the street from where my broken down car was parked. Um, and I, we could, I could walk there, or I could go to work at this car dealership up the road uh, that had just been built. Uh, it was also a walking distance. Um, so I walked up there uh, seven consecutive days. Um, and filled out applica applications seven consecutive times. Um, and by the seventh time, uh, guy comes out, walks out. I didn't know at the time, but he was a general manager slash owner of the dealership. Comes out of the uh, little tower thing and sits down with me. And it's like, son, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. He said, why do you keep on filling out applications? We're not hiring. And I said, well, sir, I need a job. And he said, well, as long as you're not going to uh, – shoot the place up, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and give you a job, but I'm kind of questioning your sanity here. I said, well, I, I need a job. So um, he gave me an opportunity, uh, thank goodness, and then um, everything took off from there. Um, there was a lot of struggles, a um, lot, of, lot of struggles. Um, and I, it, it, it took me three months to sell my first car. Um, I was awful. Uh, every mistake you could make, I made it. Um, and fortunate enough, they were very patient with me um, and gave me an opportunity to learn and to make mistakes and screw up. And um, I'll never forget it. Um, and this is a really important part of the story because um, this is where I became a man um, because I was three months in, I hadn't sold a car. And I, I came home um, and I was working my butt off. I was working every day. Um, and so um, came home, I was able to scrape up enough for you know us to get you know a roof over our head, even though I wasn't selling cars, I was still making minimum wage. And so with that being said, I came home uh, and Nicole said to me, so honey, is everybody else selling cars? I said, yeah, yeah, everybody else selling cars. She said, well, uh, maybe it's you. And I paused and I looked at her and I got angry. And I said, how, how could you say that to me? You know, I'm working hard, of course it's not me. 
um, and all of these different things, right? And I'm sitting there, and um, so I storm out, and I'm angry. Um, the next day, I come back, and I said, maybe it is me. And that's when I learned that when things aren't going well, uh, when there's something that you don't like, look no further than the mirror because that is the, the culprit, is you. And so I, I took, started to accept responsibility and say, okay, it's, it's me. It's not the clients. It's not, you know, they're not all, you know, getting, we're not all getting lucky, right? These same guys are selling cars and the same guys aren't. And so uh, when, I, when I accepted that responsibility, everything changed. Um, I went from being awful. Um, two, three months later, I was leading the board. Um, I was the top guy. Um, and the way that happened is I started to listen to other people. Um, and I started to uh, hold myself accountable for the mistakes that I made in the process. Um, and once I did that, I was off and running. Um, and so from there, um, I climbed my way up to um, finance. And that's where the, the story gets really inter interesting is I'm in, um, I'm there selling cars and I notice these guys every day, um, you know, they're wearing nice, nice shirt, tie, they're always driving a brand new car, um, and they're always getting lunch. And back in, I just remember how hungry I was all the time, um, because I, I would have to go days without eating, um, because we literally had nothing. So, um, I just remember how hungry I would be and, and how I, they would be getting Subway or McDonald's or whatever. Um, and I just remember thinking, man, I really want that. And that's when I realized that I wanted to do that. So I, I went to my, um, my boss and I said, hey, what do I need to do to do that? And he said, well, you're too stupid to do that. Um, he said, you're not smart enough. Uh, you're, you, have, you have hit your peak. What? You are where you are. Um, I and, hope he has no children. Well, he he actually does, oh. um, and, and the, the story gets sweeter uh, down the road for that. But uh, he said you're too stupid to do that. So um, what I did is I saved. Um, I said okay. I found out uh, what school those guys had to go to to become certified. It was a school called JM and A School down in Deer, Deerfield Beach, Florida. Uh, and it's about like an eight, eight, nine week course that's crammed into like two weeks. So it's really challenging um, and really difficult, but that's what you have to do to, to learn the skills you need to be able to do finance and insurance. And so I am, I'm just sitting there and I, I decide, I give them a call and I say, so what do I need to do to, you know, what do I need to do to, to uh, come to your school? Uh, you have to be, have a dealership sponsorship. Okay. And so, so you mean I can't pay for, you know, my own tuition to come to school? No, you can't. So I kept calling them every single day. And so finally, probably after about 30, 40 days in, I don't remember the exact time, but uh, finally got this, the same guy on the phone. And he said, you know what? Hold on. And so he, he goes and gets somebody and uh, he's like, this guy will not stop. He is just, it's, it's too much. Like we got to do something. And the guy says, well, you got $10,000? And I said, well, no. So you're telling me if I get $10,000, I can come to school? Yeah, you get, to, you get me $10,000, you can come to school. Don't call back till you got $10,000. I said, okay, great. So I saved it up, scraped, wow. scraped, 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 saved it up. And I called him back, and I said, I have $10,000. Oh, okay, well, here's a date. You can come to school. I said, okay, great. Now, at this time... Uh, we had a 1992 Ford Tempo. Um, the door did not work on the driver's side, so I would have to climb in and out NASCAR style. I had to cut it off at red lights because it would overheat. Um, it was the only car we had, and so I would have to drive that car from South Carolina to Deerfield Beach, Florida. Um, and so I took two weeks off from work because I had built up the time. And I drove my butt to Deerfield Beach, Florida, um, and I graduated that class with a perfect score. Wow. Nice. Um, there's only been five people in the history of taking that course that have done it at a perfect score at the time that I got it. So, um, so I, I proved at that point that I could do it, um, and I worked my butt off. So I drove back. I was excited. I couldn't wait to show, show my, my boss the, 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 you know, the certificate of completion. And so I walked back up in there with my head held high, and I laid the certificate down, and he goes, 
what is this? And he looks at it, and I said, I got a perfect score. And I showed him the sheet where I had a perfect score. He looked at me, and he said, you're fired. <gasps> <laughs> what? You're fired. Um, so I got fired that day um, because I can, went. Can we name names? Yeah. Can we just put this guy all the way out there? I can't, I can't put him out there. Man. Oh, my God. We need to put this guy all the way out there. We yeah. need to put him on blast on yeah. social media. Yeah. He, he fired me. He fired me. And what so, was his reason? Um, I went against what his wishes were, which was, um, you know, he told me I was too stupid, so I, sh I was supposed to stop. Um, and without the backing of the dealership, <clears throat> um, I was an embarrassment uh, to the dealership, and I was insubordinate. What a miserable and, man. And so, yeah, so they fired me. Um, and so <laughs> we're ready to swim. The two of us are like, yeah. <laughs> tell us where he lives. <laughs> so, so I, I gathered my things. Um, and then I went to the rival dealership, uh, about 30 minutes up the road. Um, and I said, Hey, you know, this is my experience. This is what I have. I have my, you know, certificate. I want to be in finance. Um, they said, well, we will, we will, um, hire you as a salesperson. Um, you have proved yourself as a salesperson that we will maybe look at putting you in finance. Well, I stayed there for about two years, um, and they never, they kept passing me over, kept passing me over. So finally, I decided to go to a dealership where good car guys go to die. This dealership was the worst dealership in Honda's franchise in the entire United States. And it happened to be in a little town in North Carolina, in Statesville, North Carolina, um, and this dealership sold about 10 cars a month. And so I went to it and I said to, said to the guy when I got there, I said, Hey, you know, you guys aren't selling any cars. I have this finance certificate. If you will allow me to do finance, I will come here and I will do finance. And I'll promise you, I will triple your production at least. And he said, he was an old, old, old redneck. And he said, well, if you can get us to 40 cars a month, then I'll let you do it. So my first month, I got us to 60. I sold every car that we had on the lot. Nice. And I'll never forget, Nicole, we had one car. We had, we had a nicer car by, the, by this point. We had a, a Honda Civic, and it, it was amazing. Uh, it was a little tiny car, but it was amazing because it was new. Um, and I remember Nicole driving up to pick me up from work, and she's like, where are all the cars? I said, I sold them all. So we literally ran them out of cars. So they had to get an emergency shipment from Honda. It's great. So I finally got my shot. And so from there, I became uh, the top finance manager in the United States of America for all of American Honda. I uh, did that wow. three consecutive years back to back to back. As a matter of fact, it was the, that's how we got to Vegas the first time because I was the number one ranked finance manager in the country and we got to stay at the Wynn Las Vegas. Um, and so that, that was our reward. And uh, we got to come twice. Uh, the third time they didn't do that trip, but um, it was three consecutive years. Um, I then got on with American Honda Finance um, themselves, uh, became very, very successful. Um, making a couple hundred grand a year, had you know, had my two kids, um, and things were just were just great. Um, and then um, in 2019, um, I became discontent. I had been uh, making that good money probably for about 10 years, um, and I felt unfulfilled. I mm -hmm. felt like, well, dang, you know, we we're here. Um, I work a lot of hours, but I'm not helping anybody. Um, and so Nicole and I uh, started uh, Parks Insurance Agency. When we first started Parks Insurance Agency in February of 2019, uh, it was for life insurance. And so we did the life insurance um, for a little while, and I was still at Honda, still working. And I, I was there, and, and, you know, it wasn't going that great on the life insurance side. Um, it was just all kinds of little pitfalls and whatever, but we weren't doing much. And I met a, met a client named Donald Kincaid, um, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me using his name, but uh, he gave me a call um, needing life insurance. I helped him out, and he wanted me to do health insurance, okay? And for a long time, I sat there, and I, I said, man, I, I, 
you know, I kept kind of blowing him off, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll do it. But, I, you know, I really wasn't going to do it. And so <laughs> I kept blowing him off and blowing him off. And so he, he did me the same way I did everybody else. Um, he called me every day for six weeks. Um, and I'm not kidding. Um, and then one Friday afternoon, he came into my office and sat down and said that he wasn't leaving until I called Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so finally I got frustrated, picked up the phone, called Blue Cross Blue Shield. And little did I know that all of the things that, that had happened in my life, um, my brother um, who uh, had returned from incarceration when I was a child, so I got to see how, what that looked like up close and personal um, and the challenges that he had with resources coming out, especially medical resources. Um, and I, I, little did I know where all that would end up leading. Well, I called Blue Cross Blue Shield. They said, okay, great. You got to train for six weeks before we'll talk to you. Great. And so I had to do that. So I did that. Um, and, and one, you know, I, I wish I knew the exact date, but it was in November of 2019 um, in Camden, South Carolina. My life would change, and I'm going to say millions of lives mm -hmm. will be changed because of this meeting. Um, and in that day, I found out why everything happened the way it did. Um, and so I went to uh, this Starbucks in Camden, and I sat down with uh, Missy Ferguson Peoples, who is a regional director for Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. And we go over the programs, and the programs are very expensive for individual and family, um, you know, plans. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I just wasted six weeks of my life. Donald can't afford this. This isn't going to work, right? And so she she goes goes to walk. We go to walk out the door. We're done. We had been there for a couple of hours. Um, and she says, wait a minute. I forgot to tell you about this one program that they just kind of repealed this because of COVID that happened and really want to, you know, get into this. Um, but with that being said, you're probably not going to want to do it because it doesn't really pay a whole lot. So this program pays, and I'll give you guys a percentage, this program pays about 5% um, of what the other plans pay, uh, which are significant. And this program pays little to nothing, pennies. And so I said, well, I don't, you know, necessarily care about that. You know, what are you talking about? Well, she said, you can get free health insurance on this program. I'm like, oh, my God, free health insurance. What are you talking about, free health insurance? You mean like a discount plan? No, 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 free health insurance. So she goes into this whole story of how it all works, right? And so I find out about this amazing program that is for real. And I'm just like, I can't believe it. I'm like blown away, right? And in that moment, guys, it clicked. I sat there, and all of a sudden, all the memories started rushing back from my brother to the failure for football to finance and insurance that I learned that I had to go to school for, all the years of experience in finance and insurance with Honda, it all came to me in that moment. And I said, ah, that's why. That's why I was born. This is why, right here. Um, and I'm gonna have to go do something very, um, very uncomfortable I'm going to have to quit my job. Wow. And we quit, quit the job at Honda. Yes. We are a couple, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Yep. Two young kids at home. Yeah. Your wife. Yep. Okay. And she does not, she's always been home and we have always been a one income household. What was her response to that? Well, that was very interesting. So, <laughs> so I leave that Starbucks, I go quit my job. Right. Um, my Did you tell her? No, prior? no. Okay. So I, oh, I go juicy. quit. I go quit my <laughs> job, and the the boss is like just flabbergasted. He's like, "Are you you're crazy? There's no way you you can't quit." Yeah, I'm quitting. I'm done. And so I go home in the middle of the afternoon. Pull up, and it's kind of like that feeling you get in your stomach when you're a kid and you're in trouble. <laughs> Do you forget that? <laughs> you remember when you were a kid and the print that they, they say, you know, Adam Clawson needs to come to the well, principal's he, he office. He usually wound up in handcuffs, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there. Uh, Adam Clawson, yeah. come on to the principal's office, and, and the whole class goes, ooh. Uh, <laughs> That's how you feel, right? Yep. And so yep. I, I get out of the car, and Nicole, Nicole's in there, you know, making dinner or whatever, and the kids are still not home. And so I, I walk in the door and 
and opened the door and she's like, oh, hey, honey, you're, you're home early. Why didn't you call me and tell me you were coming? And I'm like, eh. She's like, what's wrong? I said, I quit my job. She said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you what? <laughs> you quit? Yeah, yeah, I quit. And she's like, to do what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, to sell free insurance. She said, honey, you need to sit. <laughs> sit down. Are you kidding me? You need to sell free health insurance? How much is this going to make? I said, oh, about 10, 15 bucks. She said, Aaron, are you okay? <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. Uh, you don't understand. This is why I'm breathing. This is why <laughs> I'm here. She, she, she thinks I've gone completely nuts, right? And, been there before. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I look her in the eye and I say, honey, if we go down, we're going to go down with Parks Insurance. If we go down, we're going to go down helping people. If we lose this house, this car, and all of these things, so be it. And so she said, well, I I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll follow you, right? Wow. Ride or and, die. And so she did it. She followed me. Um, and we have now become the top producing company in the United States of America of this insurance, um, serving over 100,000 families. Um, wow. Since the beginning. So uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Is it is that your personality, though, that you had to quit your job because you had to have nothing in order to succeed? Because <laughs> it just way. it seems repeat. Yeah. Incredible. It's the only way you have to. And I told you guys this last night yeah. at dinner. Um, you got to burn your boats. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about the Vikings and, um, you know, the, the story behind that is, is that they were no bigger, no faster, no stronger. Um, but when they got to a place to conquer it, they burned their own boats. Um, and so they had no choice. There was no retreat. There was no option. It was either through the opposition or they were going to die trying. And um, that's where you have to get to to be successful. Yeah. Um, and you have to be willing to struggle and dig and fight and have guts and courage. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. And that's not where it, you know, in, in that moment, uh, the hard times didn't stop. You know, um, it, it took us a couple of years after that to get to where we are now. So I'm going to pay you a compliment that's going to sound like an insult, but you're going to understand what I mean. And then you're going to have to explain it. Oh. You, Mr. Aaron Parks are a dog. Yes. What does that mean? Yes. So <laughs> we talked about that yesterday. So um, sport, all you sports guys will appreciate this. Um, there is basketball players and then there's MJ. Um, he's a dog. Um, you know, there's no, you know, he's not afraid. Um, he's going to always take that shot. Kobe Bryant was the same way. Um, Mamba mentality. Didn't care if he shot 25 air balls to shot the, the previous 25 shots he's taking the last shot and he's gonna he's gonna rip your heart out to win um and that's that's the way I'm built um I don't care who says no um I don't care how many times you say no um the God I serve is bigger than your no um and if it's his will it's gonna happen um and I believe this is what he wanted me to do um and so with all of the, the, the all those emotions you know, flooded back at once. And um, I realized in that moment what I was supposed to do. And so um, if that meant losing everything, um, that's okay um, because that's his will if I lose it. So what? Um, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so we're going to help um, every man, woman, child in this country have access to this or I'm going to die trying. Wow. That's powerful. And I, I love the analogy, you know, burn your boats, go all in. Clearly you've done that. You've had tremendous success, 100,000 families. That's a lot. And, and what is the goal? The goal is to, uh, the, the goal is, is to have this accessible for every, all 300 million Americans in this country, wow. um, to have it accessible. Um, whether or not they take it, well, you know, of course, is up to them. Um, but if we can just make it accessible for them and make it, make it to where the homeless and the people that are struggling to make ends meet, the people that are out here working every single day, um, trying to scrape and take care of their children, to know that they have this amazing gift available to them um, is, is all that matters to me.
Mm. Well, and this is kind of where our paths crossed because I had the good fortune to get connected to you through the organization that I joined not that long ago, Social Purpose Corrections, you know, came on board there and bring all of my, my knowledge, my skills from while I was incarcerated, you know, working within those settings. And for me, it was always, always a priority to make sure that I was doing everything that I could to make sure that individuals like myself were better off upon release and you know prior to their release and then ultimately as they're coming back into the community like we experienced it and we've talked much about our journey man there was a lot of challenges a lot of things that we did not anticipate despite the fact we spent a decade preparing for it despite the fact that she had a good job you know and was able to be that safety net we came out during covid so things were as crazy as it sounds during that period was the ideal time for us to make that transition. So we had a chance to kind of um, view the process, to be observers of it as we were going through it and constantly reflect and go, damn, I don't know how somebody who doesn't have a wife that's right there, that's able to take me to all these appointments, these check-ins, you know, struggling with my health, physical health, you know, I spent 20 years incarcerated and they didn't take care of anything. I still have an ACL that's blown out that's never been repaired, which resulted in other issues. You know, never got to go to a dentist, didn't have my teeth cleaned in almost 15 years. All of those things and understanding that having that access to not only the physical components, but substance abuse treatment, right? Mental health, prescription meds, like there's people coming out they got diabetes, they have mental health that needs medication, whatever the issue might be, generally those systems are not in place. And the alternative is what? Medicaid. Medicaid's not set up for this. And believe me, you have educated me over these last few months, like shown me a whole different world that I had no idea, despite all that time I spent in the inside, despite feeling like I was really well connected to the available resources. I had no idea about this. And the crazy thing is the reason my voice is gone right now is because I'm doing back to back to back to back calls every single day, sharing the education that you've given me with others. And these aren't just like random people. These are prominent, they're politicians, they're directors of Department of Corrections, they're sheriffs in, in jails, like all of these people that have no idea that this opportunity exists that for their part, you know, to, to achieve positive outcomes, to know that the people in their care are going to get out and have a higher chance of success, like this is something that they start to get really excited about. And they always ask me, they're like, wait a minute, man, this sounds a little too good to be true. And I always have to laugh because that's really where our conversation started. And man, you schooled me on it, gave me the whole history, all the background. And I know nobody on the podcast is probably too interested to get into all that history or hear us talk about that. But there is an opportunity, like more than happy to get anybody connected who wants to get connected to the insurance, gets connected to parks, like what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. And who you're doing it for is even more phenomenal. Yes. And man, I wish I would have had this when I got out, right? Like right. You could uh, tell them to scan that QR code that's on the screen right there. I'm going to leave it up for the remainder here, but that'll take you to the website. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Um, man, but what's more powerful about this. Like I'm a big believer in relationships, right? And Ro and I frequently have this conversation about being intentional about who we allow into our circle, making the choices and the relationships that we choose to invest in. And the last couple of years have been rough. Yeah. Right? We've we've gone through some challenges ourselves, had those difficult conversations, found ourselves at those crossroads. And to look back and go, you know what? It was all to put us right here. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with the CEO of my organization before we came here today. And 
he was so excited because there's all these things developing. I said, I'm going to pick up Aaron. Then we're going to go in here. We're going to, you know, be in the studio and have a chance to talk about this. And I was excited about it. And I said, this is how it's supposed to be. Like I wake up in the morning, I'm excited. A lot of times I don't even know what's on the agenda for the day, but I know I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm fulfilling my purpose. I'm serving people that genuinely need what I have to offer. And I'm working with other great people who have the same intention. Now, we heard a bit of your story last night, but there were pieces that I didn't even know until today that you shared. I had a feeling that there was more, but man, like it all makes sense now, right? Your story, your struggle, feeling, knowing that you are right where you're supposed to be, like also affirms me that we're right where we're supposed to be. And I'm grateful to be sitting down with you today and definitely looking forward to us spending more time together. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, I mean, it's a privilege, man. You know, you guys' is, story is so inspirational uh, to Nicole and I. And, um, you know, we were just uh, looking, you know, we were sitting in the wind last night, just looking out, um, you know, over the strip and, and um, just reflecting on, we just can't believe um, where we are. You know, we talked about um, the, the old, the tempo uh, with you know, overheated the red light, man. I had to freaking cut the thing off and, to pull over and add water to it and um, just all of those things and all of those difficult things. And man, we, it's unbelievable. I mean, we, we have impacted so many people um, and we're going to do even more. And it's just, it doesn't even feel real sometimes. Mm. Do you have any other questions for Aaron? Because I feel like, man, this is, it's been incredible having this conversation. Yeah, I don't have any other questions, but I was going to ask you one that you just answered without me asking yeah. where I was going to ask you, you know, you've come so far and how do you stay so humble? Because you and Nicole oh. are so lovely, you know, and but I think you just kind of answered it by saying you reflect and gratitude, but correct me if I'm wrong, please. We we, we do. Uh, that's a that's part of it. Um, but the other part of it is my faith. Um in believing and understanding where it all comes from um, and understanding that, yeah, I, you know, I, I fought and, and I worked my butt off and we did all that. Um, but without God, you know, it's none of it, none of it happens. Um, and he is really the champion here. Um, he is really uh, the president of Parks Insurance, not me. Uh, I'm just a stand in. Um, he could have used anybody um, for his, uh, for his will. And, he chose me, and um, I'm very humbled um, by that. Um, and I never, ever let myself get up there because um, that's his spotlight. Um, and so, you know, we, we had a situation I told you guys about in the car. You know, we had a, a, a difficulty with a, um, a homeless shelter not letting us help the residents there. And um, everybody had, you know, get, was really upset yesterday. And um, and said that, ah, oh, you know, we, we probably won't be able to, you know, get this worked out anytime soon. And um, I told him, you know, you got to have faith and uh, I know he'll do it. And um, and so woke up this morning with a text message and an apology. And um, they're going to set up tables for us to come help the guys out um, on Tuesday. And, um, you know, it's just God's power, man. That's all it is. Um, it's not me. It's him. And he's in control. Um, and I know that, right? And so um, that's how I stay humble. And that's how Nicole and I both stay humble. And we're just, we're just blessed, man. We just blessed. We just want to help people and um, just uh, live our lives helping people. That's it. In service to others. I love that. What's your quote about helping enough people? Key to getting everything that you want in life is to help enough other people get what they want. Facts. Firm believer in that. I mean, that's why we are where we're at. And grateful to be around other people that share that, that value that same, you know, investment in helping others, serving others. Honestly, that's what it's all about. And you look at those people who are really, really successful and they'll generally acknowledge the same thing. So, yeah, it's true. It's, um, you know, to kind of expand upon that as far as, you know, I think there's like this, um, I don't know, uh, misconception, if you will, that. You know, if you, you go out and you help others, you have to be poor yourself. Um, not true. Um, you know, God 
you look in the Bible, you look what he did with King David and King Solomon. I mean, they had everything, right? And they were, you know, um, obviously two of his favorite people. Um, and so he wants us to be successful. Um, and like you said, Adam, you said it best. If you serve enough people and help them get what they want slash need, um, you will have everything you want. And uh, we live a life that is doesn't, again, doesn't feel real. I wake up in the morning and sometimes uh, I like, wow, is this, they really gonna pay me to help somebody today? Like, are you kidding me? Um, and it's the way it is. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy what happens when you, when you serve others and that, that becomes your focus. Everything else comes organically. Yeah. I love this. And, and part of my life's path and purpose, I believe was, um, to help support loved ones of the incarcerated and Mm -hmm. you being a loved one of somebody who was formerly incarcerated. I always said that the biggest struggle I found for the people in my community were one legal services and two mental health services. So, and I never knew how I would be able to help provide that to my community because I don't have the financial backing to do that. But this right here answers that mental health component. And, and it goes even a step further where if you don't feel well, the rest of the world is crumbling around you. I mean, how, you can't go through the day all day, every day, day after day in tons of pain and operate at an optimal level. So I appreciate this so much on behalf of that whole entire community that that is a huge step to be able to to just live. Right, it is. And this is something I don't really talk about. Uh, y'all, y'all heard it from Nicole last night at dinner a little bit. Um, but my mother-in-law, and I don't talk about it because it's, it's really um, – really a sore spot for me. It's really emotional. Um, my mother-in-law died um, because she didn't have substance abuse treatment available to her. Um, she was in and out of prison uh, in jail and tried to check herself into rehab, could never find a rehab that would take her, mm. could not afford the insurance. And she died of a drug overdose because of it. Mm. Um, and it's it's a it's it's a really sensitive subject for me um, because I had a lot of love for her. Um, she was very troubled. Um, you know, um, Nicole's grandmother had to raise her because of uh, the troubles and things she had. But you wouldn't ever, I mean, you would never meet a nicer person um, and a better human than her. Um, she was very giving, um, very uh, very very wonderful person that just could not get the help she needed. Um, And that's what drives me. Um, And I can tell you that um, if any DOCs or, um, you know, uh, jails, prisons or any anybody's listening to this, uh, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. Um, You will. If you haven't met me yet, you will. Um, And you need to be on my side, uh, because if you're not, it's not going to be good for you. And if you're a family member, I'm coming with him. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Yep, it's not going to be good for you because there's no links that I will go to. Guys, it's not about money for me. Uh, we're, we're, we're very comfortable. Um, and, I mean, if we stopped right now, we'd be great. Um, but <laughs> what Nicole says it all the time, and I say it in my presentation when I'm talking to uh, DOCs and prisons and jails. I am the most dis- dissatisfied, successful human being on planet <laughs> Earth. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, that is me. Um, yeah. And... I am. It's. I have to remind myself to enjoy myself and, and enjoy, you know, the fruits of my labor and things like that. Uh, Nicole has to remind me of that uh, because I work. Um, my work ethic is sickening. That's why you guys um, get along. I, I I work. I work till two a.m. and I'll get up at six seven, um, and I'll do it every single day. Um, and if somebody's in the way of helping others. Um, I will, I will make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear about your mother-in-law, but I love that you use that as your purpose and part of your drive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I don't talk about it a lot. It's a tough one. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, it hurts. It still hurts. I mean, she's been gone now for, you know, about 14 years and it still hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's finding that purpose, that meaning, that's where that drive comes from. And the persistence that I heard throughout your story, they better not doubt you when you say that you're coming. 
because you've proven it time and time again. And I say it all the time. I'm like, I don't know how anybody would ever bet against us because of what we've been through. But it's like his story, amazing. It's the same thing. How could you ever bet against someone who's already been through what you've been through and accomplished what you've accomplished? Listen, I anticipate continued success far in excess of anything that you can see right now. And I am happy to be a part of this and support you in any way that I can. I'm coming with you to all those DOC meetings, by the way, man. Got that right. I That's am, right. I am here. I am, I am grateful to have met you. And I'm really grateful that we had an opportunity to spend some time in here with you today to get all of this recorded because, man, you have an incredible story, power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. That's what this podcast is all about. Before, I'm sorry, were you ending? Yes. George, real quick, yes. if yes. there's a QR code on the screen it and is. somebody's it watching, is. I know, but oh. if they're watching from their phone, yeah, how do you scan a QR code like that? Do you have to take a screenshot? Take a screenshot, go to your camera roll, and then you should just 3D touch it. And okay. it, it should just open up the link. Okay. Uh, but that link right there will take you, ladies and gentlemen, to this website right here. And then you can fill out your forms, but it takes you to the park agency. So Thank you. I just never knew how to uh, do that. And if you, do, if you do go to the website um, without the QR code, make sure in the referred by box you put gridability in the referred by box, please. There you go. Gridability. Power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. It's been another incredible episode with our guest, Aaron Parks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your podcast host. Adam Clausen, the beautiful, ever radiant. Ro Clausen. And we'll see you back here on the next episode. Oh.